Got it. Woo, that's loud. All right. I thought maybe I was having to shout too much. Now I can calm it down. Um, I hit the button. It didn't go. Um, but anyway, let's start our worship service. Maybe if we can get to singing, we can sing some people in. Uh, that means you've got to sing nice and loud. All right. Let's sing. Let's, uh, it is Palm Sunday, so we're going to start out with Hosanna, Praise is Rising. Will you stand with us as we, as we sing? Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you. We long for you. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the highest. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Come have your way among 
Good morning. Welcome to the Baptist Fellowship on this bright, sunny morning with all the snow that we've had. It's exciting. Well, we have a number of announcements, as you can imagine, as we start this special Holy Week. First of all, this afternoon at 3 o'clock is our Menning Nursing Home service. So we'd love for anybody to join us up there at 3 o'clock. Um, we'll be doing that this afternoon. And then tomorrow we have our special prayer time for this Easter week and all of the activities that are coming up. Um, so if you would like to join the folks for that, it's at 10 o'clock. Or if you have people that you are inviting that you would like to be prayed for, that they will come um, this weekend, please let Donna know, and they'll be specifically praying for these folks to actually come. All right, what is happening next weekend? We start with Good Friday on Friday night at 7 o'clock is our Good Friday service. A very different service than any other time of the year, but a time where we can completely reflect on what Jesus did for us, and of course it ends with communion as well. So really would love for you to come um, to that service. On Saturday is our Easter extravaganza. It's going to be crazy. We already have 50 kids registered. Last year, this was our biggest event of the year. We had about 160 people. This room was packed. Um, we could definitely use helpers for this, both before, um, during, and after the cleanup. <laughs> uh, but we, um, so there is a clipboard going around. Please see that. There's food items. There's worker needs. I even have some things I could use help with um, during the week if you want to see me as well. But we are expecting a large crowd. The kids will come with their families. We're going to do an Easter experience first where we share um, what Easter is really all about first. So we're going to start with creation. Uh, we're going to be doing the uh, fall, Adam and Eve, and then doing Jesus coming to earth with animals. So excited. Um, and uh, the crucifixion and the resurrection, all um, very hands-on as we go throughout doing this tour. Um, and then we'll be in here doing games and activities like that while they're waiting for everybody to go through. And then we'll have our Easter egg hunt. And the ladies have told me, I think it's going to be 3,000 or more eggs. They're really getting close to have already put that much in that are going to be hidden outside. Um, again, if you can help hide eggs, if you can help be the boundary in the woods, uh, the egg hunt goes so fast. Oh, my goodness. Last year it was over in like 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, but we would love for your help with that. Also, we're giving um, all the families a hot dog lunch um, provided as well. So we're excited for for that. Again, that's this Saturday at 10. If you can help, please see the clipboard or see me. Um, and then Sunday, of course, Easter Sunday. Three different things. At the Whale's Tail at 7 o'clock because of the time change. It's later this year, so I'm very thankful for that. I'm hoping it will be warmer than last year as well, but we're meeting with several other area churches at the Whale's Tail. Billy will be speaking um, this year at 7 o'clock in the morning. Then we will have our Easter breakfast here um, in the fellowship hall at 9.30, so that will take the place of Sunday school, and then we'll come right in here for our Easter service at 10.45. Really, really looking forward to this whole weekend. I hope you can join us for everything, if you can, and bring along friends. So those little cards are out there. I've been hearing of people handing them out. I'm so excited. Keep handing them out and bring people with you so that they can hear the gospel. The truth of what this is all about. Um, one last announcement. You can see upcoming events starting not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, right after Easter. We're going to be getting to uh, watch The Chosen Season 4. It's not even out on streaming yet um, on Wednesday night, so that will be here in the sanctuary. Uh, if you haven't seen The Chosen yet, don't wait. Go see seasons one, two, and three, but you can't even see four. The only place you can see four in our area is to come here on those eight Wednesday nights um, in a row. They'll be doing that, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that, except that I'm with the kids, so I'm not going to be able to see it with you all, uh, but I will get to see it. I'm excited for that. All right, I'm going to let you do our mission. Yes, yes. Okay, so this month we have been highlighting our North American Mission Board uh, offering um, in order to to support and to sponsor the missionaries in North America um, through the North American Mission Board. It's called the Annie Armstrong Easter Offering. So we will be passing the plates on Easter morning to collect this uh, offering. You can skip ahead and uh, put your offering in an envelope, throw it in the in uh, the basket in the back. You can also go online and uh, give online uh, via that method and select the uh, Annie Armstrong Easter Offering, and it will be designated as such. Um, I do have another video for you, just another highlight of another missionary. This one's a little bit closer to home. Let's watch this.
team. My ministry right now looks like reaching our refugee friends and their families, our homeless friends, and also women who are experiencing exploitation. There are so many parts to the equation. We look for, you know, creative ways to, you know, meet needs. I'm really passionate about gifting essential products, but it's the importance of leaving the pews and going out and being the light and love of Jesus. We have volunteers within our churches. We're creating, you know, earrings and bracelets to then use those for our street outreach. We can um, just bless um, women that are in strip clubs or on the street. And the goal is just really that the loss will be reached with the love of Christ. When people give to the Annie Armstrong offering, uh, individuals are receiving Christ and realizing their beloved identities as beloved sons and daughters. Your generous support is going towards so many individuals who do not have a relationship with Jesus, helping them realize that they are loved and loved by Christ. So again, I want to encourage you to plan on that offering, uh, make it a point this Easter uh, to participate in this mission's uh, giving. Let's continue with our worship. Uh, we're going to, if you would, stand with me. Uh, we'll sing another song entitled Hosanna. This one's quite a bit different, though. Uh, Joy is going to lead us in, in this song. Let's stand as we sing. I see the King of glory coming on the clouds with fire. The whole earth shakes, the whole earth shakes. I see his love and mercy washing over all our sin the people sing the people sing hosanna 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 in the highest hosanna Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. I see a generation rising up to take their place with selfless faith, with selfless faith. I see a new revival. Oh, it's stirring as we pray and seek. We're on our knees. We're on our knees. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Heal my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause. 
as I walk from earth into eternity. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. such a beautiful song and such a I liked it and I picked it because I wanted us to reflect not just on the pomp and the circumstance and the the lot and everything of Christ coming into Jerusalem but on what it meant what it meant it meant that our king our God our creator was coming to give us life he came in on that donkey everyone praised him as king but he was really there as a lamb that precious perfect lamb to give his life for, for us. He was going to the cross. So our next song, it's a new song. You don't, you don't know it because even our worship team didn't know it. It's a brand new song. We're going to teach it to you this morning. It's, uh, if, if, you, if you don't know it, you can't really sing along, that's okay because I want you to hear the words of this song. By the time we get to the chorus and the bridge, you're going to be able to sing along. But really listen to the words. Um, our worship team has already asked me, hey, can we do this one again after, after this Sunday? Can we not just do this on Palm Sunday? Like, Absolutely. This is a song we're going to add to our circuit. We're going to do this a lot. It's called The Wondrous Cross. Uh, Joy's going to lead us on this one as well. Let's sing together. so sure nothing it can't endure there is a life it brings that's greater than anything I once was dead within hollowed by all my sin lost and so led astray but your love reached all the way. Yes, your love reached all the way. Oh, the wondrous cross where the Prince of Glory died. Oh, the glorious cross where your mercy bled for us. You overcame the grave Waking to a world you saved Oh, the wondrous cross Now you're my resting place When trouble I must face I won't be overwhelmed Cause Jesus your love has won And my faith looks up to thee Sweet Lamb of Calvary My song will ever rise To you alone Oh the wondrous cross Where the Prince of Glory Oh, the glorious cross, where your mercy bled for us, 
Amen. You may be seated. So I um, forgot <laughs> this week to, um, oh goodness, I'm all tangled up here. Um, I forgot this week to give um, our deacon, as I'm totally tangled up with cords here, what's going on? Um, anyway, put this over here and try to get untangled. I apologize. This is how one error compounds to another error, which compounds to another error. And Tim is very happy that I don't have this microphone on right now because it would be making all kinds of racket. Um, anyway, I forgot to tell, uh, to give Bob the scripture to read. And, and so now I'm done stalling. Now I can read the scripture. Um, I have a scripture to read this morning, and it's Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. And I picked it out on everything. And so where's Bob? Where is Bob? There he is. I forgot to give it to him, and it's 100% my fault. So I'm going to take the hit and, and read it for him. It's Zechariah. I even picked out a short one for you this morning, Bob. Just one verse. Next week I'll have like a chapter or something. Anyway, Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble. Riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. That passage of scripture was written hundreds of years before Palm Sunday. It's a prophecy. We've talked in Sunday school this morning about how do we know Jesus is God? How do we know that? I think I got all the microphones on now, Tim. I'll try this. I can put this back now. All right. How do we know? That Jesus is God. How do we know that um, he is who he says he is? How do we know uh, all, all, all the Bible, that, it, that it's true, that we can trust it, that it's trustworthy, um, that we can put our faith in Jesus? And one of the ways we learned about in Sunday school that we can do that is through prophecy. And, and we, we talked about how if, if there's, o- there's over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that point to Christ. If you took eight of them, uh, eight, that's that's eight there. If you took eight of them, just eight, just eight obscure ones, and the odds of one man fulfilling just eight of them in in human history is like one in 100 quadrillion. That's, That's a one with 17 zeros behind it. One in... 100 quadrillion. The, the author uh, of our study said that it was the odds of that happening, it would be like taking um, silver dollars, taking 100 quadrillion of them, and putting them on Texas. And those, one, those, those silver dollars would fill up Texas, and it would be two feet deep. And, and then you take one of those coins and put an X on it, Throw it in Texas, stir it all up, if you could do that with a big Texas-sized spoon. Stir it all up and then blindfold someone and tell them to go pick one and one only, one silver dollar, and for them to accurately pick up the correct one. In other words, it'd be like winning the lottery, right? It'd be higher odds than that for this to happen. A statistical impossibility. That is only eight prophecies. There's 300 in the Old Testament that Christ fulfilled in his birth, in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, and in his ascension. Over 300. It's phenomenal. It is absolutely phenomenal. So I'm excited to be here this morning. I'm excited to be uh, to present um, Palm Sunday because today is a fulfillment that what we're celebrating today and what we're studying today is a fulfillment of just one of these prophecies that he came into Jerusalem riding on a cult, this triumphant entry. You know, Easter week is so full of emotion, so much emotion, for me anyway, and and for real, for me. Easter is just, it's it's celebration, we get to Palm Sunday, and we celebrate, and it's all fun, and and we palm palm branches and stuff, and and hopefully you got your palm branch on the way in from the basket, Um, and, but then we know that Friday's coming, we know that every single day, Friday's getting closer and closer, and I'll be honest with you, I don't enjoy Good Friday at all, because I, it forces me to reminisce and to think about what Christ endured for me. 
It forces me to face the cross. And my humanity, I don't enjoy the cross. The cross is only necessary because of me, because of my sin. And I don't like looking at that. And so it's very emotional. But then Sunday comes and we celebrate the resurrection that Christ didn't stay dead. Sin didn't keep him down. Our sin did not keep him down. But he overcame it and he rose again and gives us life and victory and hope and peace and all of those things. And and that's what Easter's all about. And so that's, that's a good day. I'm all excited again by Easter. So this whole week's a roller coaster for me. It just really is. It's very emotional. Today being Palm Sunday is the beginning of the Holy Week, the Passion Week. And, and it, the, today marks that moment that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey to proclaim his kingship. Today is called Palm Sunday again because Jesus was riding into Jerusalem. People were waving palms. Uh, they were cheering. They were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king. And these palm branches that, you know, it's Palm Sunday. I wanted to get into the palm branches. These palm branches are and were then regarded as tokens of joy and tokens of triumph and were customarily used only on festive occasions. You see this in Leviticus chapter 23. You see this in Nehemiah chapter 8. Kings and conquerors were welcomed with palm branches being thrown and strewn out onto the street before them and waved up in the air as well as coats and cloaks being thrown out before the arriving king. So today... As we look at Palm Sunday, this triumphant entry of Jesus, and I want us to, and we we start this this topic of talking about the kingdom of God. Um, I want to specifically talk about the surprising nature of the kingdom, the the way Jesus came and what he accomplished. It was surprising. It was different. It was not what anyone was expecting. Who here likes surprises? There's a few of you. There's a few of you. There's always a few of you. You know, when I was younger, I loved surprises, but the older I get, I've I've become less and less thrilled with them. Is is that normal? I I don't know. Uh, When I was young, man, I wanted a surprise every day, but now I kind of want to, I want things to be a little predictable. I I want things to, I want to know what's coming a little bit, uh, you know. Um, I I love to surprise people. I, I really, that's one of my, that's one of my gifts. I love to surprise people. I've, I've surprised, um, my mom, uh, many, many times, she's probably listening. Um, I, I, one time, this is great, one time Joy was away, she was helping a friend, um, I, I, either we didn't have kids yet or, or she had the kid, I don't remember, but I was left home alone, always a dangerous situation when I'm left home alone. So I'm like bored, and I'm in my 20s, what do I do? I lived in South Carolina, my, my mom lived up in North Carolina, only five hours away, and I was off that day, I'm like, I'm going to go surprise my mom. And so I did. I drove up there, and about you know, 15, 20 minutes from her house, I called her. Hey, Mom, what you doing? And we were having this great chat. And as I pulled up into her driveway, you know, I'm still chatting with her. I talked for, for another 10 minutes, and I'm like, hey, Mom, it'd be really fun. You, we should go out to lunch. And she's like, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, yeah, sure. We should go out to lunch. Where do you want to go? And we have this whole conversation about where we're going to eat and everything else. And while I'm still talking, I ring the doorbell. And she comes up to the, to the front door, and, and she answers the door, and her mouth drops open and and she does she still has the phone to her ear and she can't move it and she's just in that loop you ever get in that surprise loop you know uh, 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 you know and I completely surprised her and we had this great lunch and it's just a really good memory surprises can be a good thing sometimes Uh, and and I, I, I love doing the surprising I don't so much like the surprises anymore but I love being the one doing the surprising um there are some surprises that I can do without this morning, my furnace went out, blowing soot out of the chimney, and the whole house smells like oil. Surprise! <laughs> That's a surprise I could do without. I don't need to do that kind of surprise. Of uh, you know, um, a flat tire between exits on the interstate. Surprise! Don't like those surprises. An unexpected trip to the hospital for an injury, like two seasons ago when I was skiing and fell and broke my pelvis. That surprise, you get to go to the ER and be on crutches for six weeks. Surprise. But some surprises are awesome. An unexpected check in the mail. You can surprise me anytime with that. That's fantastic, right? So an unexpected check in the mail. An extra large helping of your favorite meal at a restaurant. You ever been in a restaurant and they're like, ah, oh, we, we just, we have extra food. Here, take some. That's a good surprise. That's a great surprise. Um, finding something that you really, really wanted. 
and it goes on sale. You see it on Amazon. It shows up. It's like 90% off. Yes. The ladies like that one. When they see, you go into the clothing store and there's the 90% off clearance rack. Surprise, you didn't know it was there, but man, you're happy to see it. Um, family showing up, uh, family that you like showing up for a visit. If you don't like them, it could be the other way. You know, family that you like showing up for a visit. Surprise. I also like a surprising plot twist in a story. I, I love reading. And when you're reading like a, a novel, a fiction novel, and all of a sudden the book goes away you didn't expect... That can be really fun. Or like when you're watching a TV show, like, like a Marvel show. The Marvel shows love to do this. And, and you're watching it, and, and the whole movie has gone a certain way, and now the movie's over and the credits start to roll. But if you know Marvel, Marvel always puts in a little snippet in the, in the middle of the credits, and you have to watch all the credits to see it. And oftentimes, that little 90-second video clip shows you, it teases you what's coming next, and oftentimes it's a plot twist. It's a surprise. Something you're like, oh, I can't believe that. I, now I have to watch the next one. I have to know what comes next. And it's a, it's a cool marketing gimmick is what it is. But it's a surprise. And I, I don't know about you, but I really enjoy that. Today, as we spend time looking at one of the greatest, um, at, at, at this triumphant entry, this, this Christ coming into Jerusalem on this, on this cult, we're actually reading and viewing one of the greatest plot twists in all of history. The greatest plot twist that's ever happened. And this plot twist is written by God Himself. And it isn't a Marvel fiction. This actually happened. This is history. This is God's story. It actually happened. So, who here today has been surprised or even shocked by your own life's journey? Yeah, a lot of us, a lot of us, right? Most of us have not every single day ex gotten what we expected. There's been moments in our life where we're like, wow, I didn't see that coming. That's, this is not the direction my life was, was supposed to go. I, mean, I had it all planned out, right? And now I'm here and I always wanted to be there. And, and I, I mean, you know, just me being in this pulpit today is not my plan. That is not my plan to be a pastor. When I was 18 years old, I was going to be a missionary aviator. I was supposed to be flying, you know, a, a, a helio courier aircraft, clipping treetops, delivering supplies and, and goods and Bibles to the natives down in South America or Africa somewhere. That's what I had envisioned for my life. And, and God's like, yeah, no, not so much. I want you over here. I, you, you'd, be, you'd be better at this. You'll, you'll be more productive here. Surprise, right? And, and we're often surprised by life. Sometimes it's good surprises. Sometimes it's not su good surprises. Sometimes it's, it's like we're just shocked at how God is using you. You're like, wow, I didn't realize God could use me in that way. I didn't realize that God could do that. Or, or sometimes it's, it's shock, shock, being shocked at the suffering that our decisions calls on us, the, the things that we have chosen that have brought suffering into our lives. When's the last time that you were genuinely, really genuinely surprised by God? Like, like you had to take a step back and say audibly, wow, I didn't see that coming. I didn't see that coming. That is exactly how the story of the event surrounding Palm Sunday goes. It's an unbelievable, unimaginable surprise. Even though the prophets had warned it like a bunch of times, <laughs> they totally missed it. It was a surprise. It began early Sunday morning. Jesus is walking towards Jerusalem. He stops for a moment and he sends two of his disciples to go ahead of him to a nearby village to carry out a special errand. Here's how Luke records that event. Luke chapter 19, verse 28 says, After telling his story, Jesus went on towards Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. And he came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, and he sent two disciples ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them, and as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. These two disciples must have wondered about what Jesus was asking them to do. This, and to them, was also a surprise. What was he asking us to do? You know, none of the Gospels account 
have any accounts in the ministry of Christ, they never, ever, ever mention him riding an animal. All through Scripture. The only thing he ever rode was a boat to go across Galilee. Everywhere else he walked. He got a lot of miles on those sandals. He walked everywhere. Never is it recorded that he rode an island, uh, uh, an animal. He must have walked hundreds of miles up and down what we call the Holy Land. Never any mention of him riding. So that was kind of a surprise. Well, what's he want a donkey for? That's a new request. Haven't heard that one before. He gives us unusual command to go into the village to get a colt that had never been ridden and to bring it to him. It must have seemed strange indeed. He even tells them the exact words that they are to use when asking the question. They are to say, the Lord needs it. Was this prearranged? Did, did the guy who had the donkey know he was coming? Did the owners know that Jesus was going to do? We don't, we don't know. I, I, I have the opinion that, he, that they didn't. Um, but I, there must have been a relationship there because when he said the Lord needs it, they knew who the Lord was. So there must have been something there. But it's obvious, though, that, that Jesus knew what he was going to face in the city of Jerusalem. So his decision to go to Jerusalem must have been one of the most difficult decisions that Jesus ever made. And on top of that, to ride into the city on a colt rather than walking into it as he had done often before must have even been a more difficult decision. Because riding on a colt into the city was a public declaration that he was a king. Everyone knew that. That symbolism, the the symbology of that act was not missed on anyone. Riding into a village on a donkey was a declaration of kingship. You see, in times of war, if you were riding into town on a white prancing stallion, that was a symbol that you were there as a conquering king, that you were there as a conqueror. But in times of peace, riding in into a town, into a city, a king would ride on a donkey, would ride on a colt, when, to symbolize that peace had come, that peace would prevail. So for Jesus to ride into Jerusalem upon a colt was to declare that not only was he a king, but he was a king that was bringing peace. Now this is weird. Just it's a surprising. Jerusalem was under Roman rule. The Romans were mean. They were nasty. They were awful. They as you rode in, there were people on the sides of the road being crucified. I mean, it was a gruesome thing. That was not a great, they were not a great occupier. They did not bring free health care. It was bad. And, and they, they ruled with an iron fist. They had the people of Israel under their boot. Jesus rides in as king on a donkey, bringing peace. The people of Israel wanted a king of war, a king that would overthrow Rome, a king that would... would, would remove that yoke of Rome off of their shoulders and give them victory and then peace peace sure but peace later let's let's fight first (laughs) right Jesus comes in and says let's skip to the peace part let's just skip right to the peace part how how would you respond to that if you were in Israel how would you respond how did these people respond would they recognize that his kingdom was not of this world that it was a spiritual kingdom that that he was to be a spiritual king well, small chance of that happening because he had been teaching that, them that very thing for three and a half years and they still hadn't learned the lesson. He had been proclaiming this for three and a half years. Perhaps some of them would greet him with laughter. Maybe they would be amused by what Jesus was doing. After all, it was rather uh, a ridiculous picture. Uh, here, here's a, uh, a stonemason. Uh, a carpenter, right? Uh, most, most often thought there wasn't a lot of wood there, so it was probably most likely a stonemason. A self-proclaimed, self-taught rabbi declaring himself to be king, riding in on a donkey. Some would say he's a lunatic, living in a world of fantasy, imagining himself to be a king, and they would laugh at him. Others may greet him with anger, you know, uh, upset because they would interpret his riding into that city on the donkey as arrogant and as blasphemy against God. Many would hail him with joy and and welcome him as an earthly king, come to establish the throne of David uh, and overthrow the Roman Empire. They were ready and they were eager and they wanted to crown crown him, put that crown upon his head. They were like, well, maybe he couldn't find a white horse. 
Maybe all he could find was a donkey. We'll forgive him for that. Let's overthrow Rome and let's have a party, right? Among the crowds would have been people that he had healed. Some of them among the thousands that he had fed. Many more had seen some of his miracles as they listened when he spoke with authority, as Scripture said. They had listened and their lives had changed. They had, had learned something. Jesus knew all of this. As he looked out over the crowds, as he looked over the horizon uh, of, of the people, he knew who was there, he knew their thoughts, he knew their emotions, and he knew just over that horizon was the cross, looming like a monster ready to consume him. But Luke tells us that in spite of all of that, riding into Jerusalem, knowing that the people didn't get it, knowing that the cross was just over the next hill, Luke chapter 9, verse 51 says, When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He was intentional. Even though he knew he would be misunderstood, he knew he would be rejected, he knew that he would face the cross, he set his face to Jerusalem. Jesus rides towards the gate of the city. The crowds are growing. There is a festive nature to the air. It's Passover. There are pilgrims from all over the world, near and far, Jews coming back to Jerusalem to offer their Passover sacrifices, to take, place, to take part in the, in the feast and the meals and the family gatherings of the greatest of all Jewish holidays. And even before Jesus arrives, the news is spread do you, know, do you know your Bibles well enough? Are you, are, you, are you Bible literate? Do you know what happens right before the triumphant entry? Just, just a little bit before? A guy named Lazarus was raised from the dead. Just a few days before, Jerusalem hears the news. Did you, hey, did you hear? Bethany's like next door to Jerusalem. Hey, did you hear? Guy died over in Bethany. He was in the grave four days. Big deal, big deal. He's a very important guy. Everyone knew him. He's dead. Man, he stunk. He was, he was dead, dead. And he, he was dead for four days. And this guy, that preacher, that teacher guy that's been going around causing all the trouble, that Jesus guy, he called out to him and, and he rose up and he walked out of the tomb. That would make the news. Like, think about it. That would make the news. Even here, that would make the news. That's wild. That happened. There was a lot of excitement. Everyone knew the name of Jesus. He raised Lazarus. Now he's riding into town on a donkey. There was some energy. There was some excitement. Like, put it in perspective. Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and everything else, front porch forum, all of it, all of a sudden makes an announcement that Taylor Swift is going to run into Randolph to do a free concert. Can you imagine Randolph? It'd be insane, right? I wouldn't go because it's weird, but most people would. The young people would flock into town. Our, our poor law enforcement folks would be like, oh man, this is going to be a blast. And, and there would be some excitement. There would be crazy excitement. That pales to this. This was even bigger. This was even bigger. News traveled from one person to another until finally Jesus was ready to enter the city. These great crowds had collected on both sides of the road and, and they, were, they were everywhere and then there's Jesus. And they had cut all these palm branches and they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. Matthew records shouts, Matthew 21, 9 says, And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Luke records him saying this in 1938, saying, Blessed. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. There is energy. There is excitement. They're like, He's come. He's going to beat up Rome. He's going to kick Caesar right in the fanny and we're going to be free again. And, and, and this is awesome. Every, all of the Old Testament prophecies about Israel being a nation is going to be fulfilled. And, and oh, this is good. This is great. And this excitement prevailed through the whole city. And then Jesus looked at his waiting audience and he must have seen this mixture of expressions and the mixture of excitement. And there were those there that loved him. Perhaps uh, Bartimaeus was there. Bartimaeus was the man who had received his sight. And he was no longer in his beggar's rags. He was there as, as a seeing individual. How about Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was probably there. He had paid back his debt to society. He had made his peace with God. 
How about the lepers who had been outcast for, for years and years and years? Now they're healed, and they're there. They're celebrating. Their skin had been cleansed. Now they were rejoicing, maybe going to the temple for the first time in decades. And the Lord had healed them and, and given their life back to them. They're there. They're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Maybe Jairus' daughter was there, given, uh, brought back to life again after experiencing death. I guarantee you Lazarus and Mary and Martha were there. Um, Mary Magdalene was there. They were all there. Their lives reflecting the love that was in their hearts for this man who had taught them, molded them, changed them, and healed them. I'm sure there were sinister faces there, faces with angry eyes, waiting for Jesus to say just one wrong word to make one mistake. The Sadducees were there. The Pharisees were there. They were supposed to be the keepers of the law, these spiritual leaders. But Jesus had gained so much popularity and the crowds were so huge that they felt threatened and they were so full of jealousy so they just kept quiet and they watched. And the Romans were there. The Romans, fearing revolt, were watching for any sign of rebellion against Rome. They were ready. They were waiting just to crush any sign of uprising. And Jesus realized as He listens to their hosannas that the soon joyous voices would turn sinister. And those voices would drown out the voices of love and the voices of excitement. And those that were crying for Him to be King would soon be crying for Him to be crucified. Crucify Him, they would shout. Or many would just simply, like Peter, stand aside and say nothing or deny Him. And Jesus is descending along that road from the Mount of Olives across the brook towards the gate, the crowds thronging all around Him. I wonder how the apostles reacted to all of this. What were they thinking? I've always thought that Judas was probably ecstatic. This is what he had wanted. This is what he had dreamed of. This is, this is it, man. This is going to be awesome. His eyes are bright and shiny. Big grin on his face. Judas wanted Rome to be overthrown. He wanted an earthly kingdom more than any of the others. I had imagined Peter Walking out there, chest expanded, proud Peter, enjoying all the cheers. Yeah, I'm a celebrity. I'm, I'm with a celebrity. That makes me a celebrity. And, and maybe he had his hand on a sword, you know, just in case someone got, you know what, someone got frisky. You know, he would take care of it. He was all, all happy, thinking to himself, maybe it was worth it to leave all those fishnets in those boats. Maybe at last we're going to get what we deserve. You know, three years been falling around eating grain and 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 fishing paying our taxes with coins out of fish's mouths now we're going to live the high life we're we're going to be friends with the king it was all going to be worth it then there's brave thomas he had said early on let us go down and die with jesus in jerusalem and he was he was firecracker thomas was but look the 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 crowd loved loved him perhaps maybe thomas is thinking perhaps all is going to be fine you know maybe maybe he's not going to die maybe jesus was wrong Maybe we don't have to go to our death. Look at how everyone loves him. This is fantastic. Maybe we're going to rule Israel with him together. Maybe Andrew, Andrew was overwhelmed by it all. Andrew was always used to bringing people to Jesus. Andrew was always bringing people to Jesus, but one by one or in small groups. Look at him now. People everywhere. They're, they didn't have to bring anyone. They're flocking to him. How about James and John? Do you suppose they were thinking about Jesus being crowned king? so that they could be on his right hand or on his left hand. Remember that whole conversation? Who, who, who gets to be on the right hand and who's going to be on the left hand? They're like, oh, here it comes. I don't care which side I'm on, but I'm going to be on one of them. This is going to be fantastic. We get some positions of authority, some positions of power. Do you suppose maybe it was a little like uh, rush hour traffic going into Jerusalem that day? You ever been stuck in traffic? I had to go down to, to Massachusetts this past week and oh, traffic... Right? I thought I left that behind in Miami. We don't have that in, in Vermont, you know, but you leave Vermont, you don't have to go very far. You find traffic, five, six, seven lanes, bumper to bumper, cars doing crazy things, getting, getting really un, unspiritual in, in their moment, me first, you know, and uh, yeah, uh huh. I think that was a little bit what Jerusalem was like. You, you know, when you're in traffic, one car stops, everyone stops, right? The whole interstate shuts down because of one car. Because even if your lane isn't stopped, you want to see why he stopped. <laughs> and so you slow down and the whole thing turns to a mess. That's Jerusalem. That's Jerusalem. The crowd's pushing forward. And all of a sudden it stops. Maybe everyone's saying, 
What's the holdup? What's going on here? Why are we stopping? Are we going to go crown a king here? What's going on? Why, why don't, hey, up in the front, what's the problem? Let's go. Let's move on. I'm moving on. If they had horns, they would have blown them, right? Maybe they blew shofars. I don't know. The people that were closest to Jesus could see what the problem was, though. They could see it. And they realized that it was Jesus that stopped the parade. Jesus stopped. And then they saw his body begin to shake. What's going on? Is he, is he laughing? Is he is caught up in the moment? Is it joy? Is he laughing? Why is his body shaking? Laughter would seem natural after all, for everyone else was laughing. Joy prevailed. But then they saw his face, and they saw no evidence of joy. They saw no evidence of laughter. Rather, they saw sorrow, and they saw tears pouring down his cheeks. He was not laughing. He was weeping. He was crying. And the Scripture tells us that Jesus reacted emotionally many, many times in in, in Scripture, um, but only twice do we see that that he he wept. We saw him become overwhelmed with emotion when, when he saw people were hungry, when he saw people living in sin, when he saw people who were ill. And the Scripture repeatedly said he had compassion on them. But only two times does it record him actually weeping. Once when his friend Lazarus died and his friends Mary and Martha were so overcome with grief, he wept for them. Remember, Jesus wept there. He he entered into their grief with compassion and he identified with their sorrow and their despair. But why was Jesus weeping here? Why was Jesus weeping here? Why was Jesus crying on the second occasion? He looked out at the city of Jerusalem and he saw a mixture of faces and the masses of humanity crowding all around and he realized the emptiness of their lives. They had not heard the message of peace. They did not understand the message of peace. They did not understand the purpose of of his coming. They did not understand that he was not coming as as a conquering king, but as a king of peace and a sacrificial lamb to pay for their sins. That he was the Passover lamb. The feast was for him to give his life. And they didn't understand it and they missed it. They didn't understand why he was there and he wept. Luke 19.41 says, But as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it is too late. The peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close you in on, uh, close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. They had eyes, but they didn't see. They had ears, but they didn't hear. They missed the whole point of the three and a half year sermon that they had been receiving. They they waved their palm branches, but they didn't understand. They didn't get it. They missed it. In fact, their very waving of the palm branches showed that they didn't understand. You know, that's exactly what they did. Rewind just a couple hundred years when Maccabees overthrew the Syrian oppressors. When Maccabees came and overthrew the Syrian oppressors, the people celebrated and they waved palm branches. They reestablished worship in the temple. And by waving those palm branches, they were showing that they expected Jesus just to be another warlord. Another general of the armies. One that they, that they could use to lead them to overthrow the Romans. And they were saying that they were ready to pick up their swords and their shields and to go to war if He would lead them. They were ready. And Jesus is weeping and saying, I didn't come for that purpose. I didn't come for that reason. I came to show you a more excellent way. I came to show you the way of love. He said, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. If someone smites you on the cheek, offer him the other cheek. If someone wants your coat, take off your shirt as well. If they command you to carry, if the Roman soldier commands you to carry their pack for one mile, which is required by law, carry it too. Carry it too. Those people listening to those messages must have been thinking, well, those are beautiful words, but he surely doesn't mean Rome. 
He doesn't mean Rome. He doesn't expect us to love Rome. Only a lunatic would, would expect us and command us to love on Rome. We can't love Rome. But you see, that was exactly what he was saying. Love even Rome. Because Rome with her mighty army has seen the power of the sword, but Rome has never seen the power of the love of God. Show them that. Show them the power of the love of God. He also came to show them salvation. John tells us over and over and over in his gospel that Jesus asked them to believe in him. That's the key word of the book of John. Believe. Believe. Believe and you will have life. Believe and you will be saved. Believe and you will inherit the kingdom of God. Believe and you will have life everlasting. Believe. The nation of Israel had the opportunity But because they didn't understand the message, they didn't understand Jesus, because they completely misunderstood the mission, Jesus wept. He wept over them because the opportunity would be taken away. And they would never have it again. These were God's people, God's chosen people. And God had loved them and He had led them across the wilderness and into the promised land. But they didn't recognize or understand the Messiah when He walked in their midst. And they did not believe that He was the Son of God. They thought He was just another David. Just another Solomon. And because of that, Jesus wept. What a contrast. He's sitting there on a beast of burden. He sees the towering temple of God silhouetted up against the sky. And just beyond that... In the years immediately ahead, he sees the armies of Titus surrounding the holy city. He sees the temple stones being torn down and the whole city leveled. He sees the bodies in the streets, the blood running in the gutters, the hundreds of thousands of people crying because they're starving to death while Titus waits for Jerusalem to surrender. And all of that because they didn't recognize the Messiah when he came. How different their lives could have been How different the history of Israel could have been if they had recognized the one who came into their midst riding on a colt. Look at what Jesus said to him. Luke 19, 41. And as he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but it is hidden from your eyes. I want to focus on one word there. If you had only known 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 that word in the greek is gnosko this word means to know through personal experience in in the english language we have many words that mean lots of different things we have one word know and it means all kind of things in the greek this is a very specific word to know through personal first hand experience he's saying you should know me I've been here, I've been with you, I'm walking with you. Get to know me. Know who I am. Know what I'm saying. Know my message. Know that I love you. Know that I'm, I'm giving my life for you. Get to know me. Experience me. First hand experience. Experience me. The Pharisees, these other people shouting in the crowds, they didn't know Jesus. They didn't know him. They couldn't perceive who he was. He was just a person, a figure, a celebrity maybe. But they didn't know him. They had not experienced Him. Let me ask you this morning, have you experienced Jesus? Do you know Him? Not know about Him? Not know His name? Not know, not, oh, I read the Bible. No, I'm not talking about that. Do you know through personal experience? Do you know Jesus? It's Matthew who adds that Jesus looked at the city and said in, in Matthew 23, 37, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I've wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. I think a lot of people are in that same situation today. God's calling them. He's convicting them of of sin. He's asking them to surrender to Him. He's giving them the invitation to know Him, to experience Him. But they push back. And they push away and they resist because they want to live their own life on their own terms and they don't want to know Him. They don't want to experience Him. That's what Jerusalem did. 
Just like the city of Jerusalem today, we often find ourselves in the presence of Jesus. And I wonder what he finds when he looks at our face. He looked at Jerusalem and he wept. What does he see when he sees us? Does he see a people who don't know him? Or does he see a people that's concerned about so many things, worried about income taxes, worried about job security, worried about health, worried about the lack of health? Does he see people who are so busy going from here to there, so busy that they never bother to consider the things that have eternal importance? Does he see a people who recognize him for who he is, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God? When he turns and he looks into our lives, I wonder, does he weep once again because of what he sees? Do I cause a tear to go down the cheek of Christ? Will he weep because we've made him in our own image? Does he weep because we've rejected him, the Messiah, the Savior? Remember, Palm Sunday is all about the journey to the cross. It's not about the entry. It's not about the palms. All that was a mistake. It was about the cross all along. That's the point. That's the purpose. Our victory over sin doesn't rest in a palm branch. It rests in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And that happened on a cross. These citizens of Jerusalem were, were zeroed in on the miracles. The circumstances, the donkey, the palm branches, the resurrections. The, 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 they were zeroed in on the Roman oppression and their own wishes and their own desires. And they missed completely that Jesus was only there to go to the cross. Yes, He is King, but He's more importantly, perhaps for us, definitely more importantly, He's the Lamb of God. John 1.29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him, John the Baptist is speaking, and he said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. It was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. This perfect, sinless, spotless, sacrificial Lamb. They missed it. They didn't see it. The plot twist was too much for them. The plot twist was too surprising. Even though prophet after prophet after prophet had proclaimed not only his coming, but his reason for coming, they were still so surprised that they missed it. They should have watched the credits, right? Should have read them. Except they became at the beginning. They came at the beginning and not the end, right? They missed it. How about you? Do you know Jesus this morning? Do you know who He is? Have you experienced Jesus? The real Jesus, not the Jesus of the television, not the Jesus of society, not our cultural Jesus who just loves everybody and and gives you boats. Not that Jesus. The Jesus of this book. This Jesus. Do you know Him? Do you know Him? Have you experienced the real Jesus of the Bible? The real thing. The Jesus that either judges or forgives sin. One or the other. There's no option. There's only, there's, those are the only two options is what I'm trying to say. He, can, he will judge sin. We're told He will. In the end, He will judge sin. But if you call on His name, He will forgive sin as well. He will forgive sin. Jesus judges and forgives sin. That Jesus, this Jesus of Scripture, the Jesus that is inviting us to get to know Him, that Jesus, He died to pay for your ransom. Our culture teaches that He died to pay for your mortgage. It's not true. He died to pay for your sins, to pay for your ransom. Do you know Him? What are you going to do at the Good Friday cross? as we close this Palm Sunday service. I want to invite you to pray. I want to invite you to weep as Jesus wept. I want you to weep tears of repentance as you asked Him to wipe away a life of sin. And I also want you to weep tears of joy as you are accepted into the family of God. That's the Palm Sunday experience that Jesus wants us to have. 
a Sunday experience of surrender and restoration of reconciliation between God and man that is only made available through the shed blood of the cross. Will you come to the cross? Lord, we come before you as we sing this next song. Lord, I ask that if there's one here who doesn't know you personally, that has not experienced your grace and your love, as, as your forgiveness of sin, Lord, I ask that today might be the day that they have the courage to, to call out on your name and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, will you forgive me? Lord, you promised that for that person that you will give them everlasting life, you will give them peace, you will give them love, you will give them forgiveness, you will give them restoration, that, that there will be no judgment, that you will skip over that part for them, Lord, because it will be made as if they have never sinned, they will be justified. Lord, I ask that if there's one here this morning that, that needs that, that you would, your Holy Spirit would just work on their heart, that, that He would convict them to a place where they call on your name this morning. Lord, maybe there's folks in here that know you but, but have been still expecting the wrong things, looking for the wrong things, focused on the wrong things. Lord, I pray, Lord, that, that your Spirit would convict of sin and that you would show us a better way to focus on the gospel, to focus on the love that you've given us, to focus on uh, the community that we are to reach. Lord, we pray that you would bring your spirit in here to into our hearts, Lord, that, that he would be able to do a powerful work to change us to be more like you this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? I'd like to close with a hymn. And this is a hymn of invitation, really. It's... Um, Room at the Cross, uh, number 487. And if you'd stand with me, I'd like for you to sing. Uh, and, and if God's working on your heart this morning, if He is challenging you to, to make a decision, something that you've heard in this message, maybe God's Word is, has pricked something in your heart and you're feeling, you know, I, I think I just need to make a decision. Maybe you need to call on the name of the Lord. Maybe you need to ask Him to forgive you of your sins. Can I challenge you just to do that today? Maybe you're a you Christian, you've been a Christian for years, but you see something that, man, I'm one of those people in the crowd and I'm focused on the wrong thing. I need to put down the palm branch and, and, and just go to the cross and, and, and live for Him and, and work for Him and, and love for Him and, and get to know Him on a more intimate level. If that's you this morning, would you make that decision to make that a priority in your life? Not just a passing Sunday whim, oh, an Easter, an Easter week weird feeling you know it's not that it, it's making a decision in your life make it a, a starting point in your life where today's the first day of the rest of your life where you're going to live, live differently for him the song is there's room at the cross for you i want you to listen to these words as we sing and i again challenge you uh, to make a decision for the lord this morning let's sing The cross upon which Jesus died Is a shelter in which we can hide And its grace so free is sufficient for me And deep is a fountain as wide as a sea there's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Though millions have found him a friend And have turned from the sins he have sinned The Savior still waits to a hope in the gate And welcome a sinner before it's too late there's room at the cross for you. 
There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. The hand of my Savior is strong. And the love of my Savior is long. Through the sunshine or rain, through loss or in gain, the blood flows from Calvary to cleanse every stain. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Lord, we come before you this morning. And we praise you and we worship you and we do celebrate because we acknowledge that the next time that you come, it will be on that white horse and you will be the conquering king. Not that you need to conquer, but really you're just riding in claiming the victory that you've already won because you fought the battle on the cross. And it was not a battle that was earthly. It wasn't a battle of flesh. It was a battle of the powers that, that be beyond this world and, and, and principalities that you battled back and defeated, Lord. And the victory that we're going to celebrate next Sunday via the resurrection, it's sealed. The victory is sure. It's accomplished. As you said on the cross, it is finished. And yet, Lord, this world is full of people that haven't claimed the victory. Lord, I asked first that if there's one here this morning, Lord, that hasn't claimed it or has claimed it just this morning, Lord, that that you would encourage them, that you would motivate them to seek after you, to get to know you, to, to, to live with you and for you for the rest of their life. Lord, I pray that you would give that person, if they've called on your name this morning, the courage to step forward and, and to come talk with me or, or, or someone else, Lord, and, and just mention to them, hey, I accepted Christ today. Lord, I pray for the Christian in here that, that is struggling, that is walking maybe with the things of the world out front there it's big and it's scary and the surprises are, are just terrifying sometimes lord i pray that you would give them strength and that you would give them peace that you would show them that a life lived for you is a, not a life wasted but a, a life lived for anything else is a life completely at waste draw them close to you lord draw us all close to you this morning and lord is one final thing i want to just pray for this morning we have this easter service coming up lord and it's it's a it's a big deal the resurrection the gospel the message the truth over 300 prophecies point towards that event god becoming man being fully man being fully god giving his life for the sins of the world that any who call on the name of the lord will be saved that that your your will is that none should perish lord you've given us this commission to go out into the world to share the gospel to share the good news in jerusalem samaria judea uttermost parts of the world it's your will that all men hear so that some can choose lord we want to do our part we want to be obedient and so lord i ask that as we as a congregation go out and invite people to your church that you would give us opportunities to share the gospel to share the good news Lord, I lift up the names of the many names that Ms. Donna and her team have been praying for each and every Monday, that those names, those, those names that represent human beings and souls, that, that your Holy Spirit would be working on their heart to soften it. And Lord, I pray that your people would be obedient and invite these people and, and ask them to come to church, to ask them to sit with them. And Lord, if you provide the opportunity to be obedient, to share the good news with them in that moment, it doesn't have to be in a church, Lord. Lord, I pray for our church as we go into this next week as soldiers almost onto a battlefield that we would carry your banner high, have our sword, the word of God lifted high, 
that we might trumpet the good news for any who would hear as we have a good Friday service and an, and an Easter extravaganza and, and a breakfast and our Sunday services, each and every one of these events, the gospel will be proclaimed, Lord, your good news, because we want to be obedient to you. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would do his work, that as we plant these seeds, that we might also see a harvest, if that be your will. Lord, I pray for each and every person at this church, those who are here, those who aren't here this morning because of the weather. I pray that you would just pour your Holy Spirit out upon them in abundance that they might go out and change the world for you. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are dismissed. Thank you, guys.